checking the primer, and applying the gloss coat, coming up next on Monster Hobbies, let's build it! Hello everybody, my name is Trevor Ursulescu and I'm the owner of Monster Hobbies in High River, Alberta, Canada. So, are you ready to continue on with our Star Trek painting model build? Well, we're going to go upstairs and we're going to check how our primer from last episode did and see if we can spot any faults that we can correct before we apply our final gloss coat. So now let's go upstairs and check it out. And here we are on our table. And what I've done is I've actually taken a bit of time to paint some of the other Star Trek models that I have while that weather was good. But this here, these four pieces, are our ship for this video. And what I want to do is... So what I did is I turned this over and I painted both sides. And it took about three days for the trim clad to dry enough to turn it over without it leaving like a ring from the top of this thing stuck in the bottom. But that was our weather, so, you know, at least give it a week. Um, now, I don't know if you can see this on camera. Oh, maybe you can. Okay, if you look... <laughs> I need three hands. If you look in this quadrant right here... Okay, keep your eye on there. You will notice some little scratches in there. Uh, what happened here is when I sprayed the top, I had a great paint job on it. And then I noticed there was some little flakes of dust. So I went to try to remove some of them, and then I painted some more paint on top, and I think... I think that was too much paint for it, you know, under that circumstance. And it seems to have etched in a little bit where the sandpaper was. So we can take that out with by sanding it down, I should say, and possibly using some of that green filler. But it only occurred on the top of the saucer. Of course, the part you're going to see the most. But underneath, I mean, this looks really like it should. Okay, so I've taken the, the warp engines in the secondary hull outside here. I don't know if we can see it any better on film. But here you can notice there's a little bit of a, a funny spot. Now that could be part of the putty. I don't know if you can see that better. But what we're doing is we're checking for little imperfections. And we're going to note where couple of them are. This warp engine, except for that one area, looks pretty good. Oh, there's a bit of a, a slight wobble right here, just above my finger. And what we will do is we are going to use the green putty in the imperfect spots and then sand them down again. Now this side it's not too bad, but this side I noticed there's quite a bit of gap here. So we will have to fill that with the green putty. And then there's kind of a bit of a weird stuff going on here where I had to sand, uh, use the hobby knife to scrape along there. There's some uh, little scrape marks and whatnot. So if you sand between coats and check on these imperfections before we do the final coat, it'll improve your model immensely. Yeah, there's a little depression ding right there. And... Oh yeah. The divot. So divot right there needs to be addressed. But apart from that, these are very good. So let's go down and apply some green filler on our bench again. Here we are back on the bench and I've got my warp drive engine here. And we're going to lightly sand this 
and I'm going to take my my clamp off the bottom of the warp engine. And I've got this piece of this is 400 grade, and I've got some 600 grade. What I'm going to do is try to sand out and perfect this warp engine just a little bit before we start to put our green putty on. So I've got my little sandpaper block. And I'm going to affix the sandpaper to it with the thumbtacks. So that will go there. And this will go here. And there goes my hobby knife. <laughs> so basically, I'm just going to lightly sand this. Now, we know we have a divot here. So, how deep is it? If we actually sand it, cross sand it a little bit, and see if we actually need filler, or if it was just something that the paint did. Looks like it, well, can still feel it. Yeah, it's still in there. So we will need a little bit of putty right there. Maybe I don't need the 600. Maybe I can just get a good enough tooth on here. So there's two reasons to sand this. One is, of course, to check for imperfections in that primer. And the other reason is to get a nice tooth for the final coat that's going to go over the top of this. And make it look, make it look all nice at the very end. I think what I might do is sand the warp engine, this warp engine. Oh, I found another divot here, down below. I will sand this warp engine and then I will try to address the saucer section. And I will correct out the other ones off camera, but this is just so that you guys get the idea what's going on. intercooler bottoms. I'm going to leave that tape on there. Remember, I'm just lightly sanding this. I'm going to sand along here because there's that divot there. And then down here, being careful of the four windows. And the other reason to sand in between coats is to make sure that everything is nice and smooth because you can get um, orange peel or uh, uh, what do you call it? a rough surface like here. I don't know if you can hear that. 
I'll try it with the sandpaper. I don't know. But sometimes you can feel it a little bit rougher or whatever. So we want to smooth this out. Well, I'm going to take the 600 on the front of that. But between 400 and 600, it gets a pretty good grip. Or cuts a pretty nice tooth on that for the paint to adhere to for the next coat without it being too smooth. You can go smoother if you prefer. It's all up to your to your taste. You can experiment going 800, 1000 grade, 1500 grade. Just depends on how smooth and how much you want to sand. I mean that that feels pretty smooth there. But on the microscopic surface, remember this has still got a bit of a tooth to it that we can't see. But the paint will know that it's there. Okay, so I should start addressing these little imperfection spots that I missed. Okay, so there's that warp engine sanded. I'm just going to wipe off the dust down here with this rag so that we can get it ready for the putty. Now, because we're just in a stage of using putty, it's actually okay to wipe this down with a rag because we're not painting yet, so none of the rag fibers will stick onto the... You know, like if, if I was to paint this now, it would be so full of dust it wouldn't even be funny. But because we're doing the primer, I mean, because we're sanding... They're going to be filling with putty, I should say. We're going to be all right. So I'm just putting the knife in a little bit of water that I got over here. Now this putty of the Games Workshop is water-based. And mine's getting a little bit dried out. So I'm just going to add little bits of water to it and kind of mush the putty around a little bit until it starts to flow. Okay, I'll try this out here. So move this stuff out of the way. And I'm going to go right into that divot there. There, that buried that. And then we'll find this divot here. Cover that in, and now I gotta check to find the other ones. Ah, one right here. Now, this is a Games Workshop putty and it's water based, so when it's dry, uh, you can sand it. It's quite nice. Um, nice thing with it being water based is that it's not actually etching into the plastic or breaking anything. 
melting or anything, I should say. So, other than this being really, <laughs> really dusty and hairy, I think that's got the three, or the, yeah, the three areas that have the divots. So I'm holding the saucer here, and right here, it looks a little bit foggy. I did a test sanding here. There was a, a big wrinkle right there. And I'm using my 400, and I seem to have been able to get rid of it to a degree. But of course, we will have to to actually see what happens here. So this is going to be a little daunting, but what I'm doing is I'm just cross sanding right in between the grid lines. And uh, using the this end of the sandpaper, because that's what will get me in between. So yeah, going up and down, going across, going at an angle, going at the reverse angle. And it does feel smoother, not so rough. So hopefully when we do the actual paint job, it'll come up okay. Let's see, like, yeah, it, it really etched in. I know you might not be able to see this, but see the, the amount of the etching, I mean to say. But you know, if you got some decent sandpaper, you should be able to smooth this out okay. See, like now it looks a lot smoother. On top of the turbo elevator. So the, the nice part of this is that because I use so much primer here by mistake, it's going to take a lot longer to cut down into the plastic by mistake. Because when you sand like this, you can actually cut into right through the paint and get back up into the color of the plastic. But actually, this is looking, looking pretty good considering. I think I might be able to actually make this look decent when that final coat goes on it. I should start here when I spray instead of underneath. And you notice how I'm dry sanding this. You could also wet sand it. Although what I think is happening is because that, that primer, or the, the plastic fill is water-based, I think I'm actually causing it to shrink a little bit when I do wash off the dust. So that could be a reason why the divots are still kind of there. Yeah, that grid line feels low. Um, yeah, so basically I think, I think what I'll do is I'll take the sandpaper off. Just see if uh, I can't do this with my thumb. Go this way for the cross sand. Grid lines are feeling a bit light. I think I got enough paint filled in between the the grid and the line. It's not going to be so harsh looking. Oh, I can still see the scratches in her. The etching. I'm back with the sanded down saucer. And uh, <laughs> despite my good efforts, I can actually still see the etching in here. And I'm softening up the grid, which I didn't really want to do. Um, I still wanted the pronounced lines from it. So I'm going to take my chances with the etching and spray the clear, or the clear coat, the, the finished paint coat over the top of this. 
but underneath here this is all nice and smooth. See if I hadn't have gone in to try to correct the dust and spray another coat on here this actually would have been okay. So sometimes if you get dust and specks in it just leave it if it's primer because I could have sanded it down when it was fine. So just so you guys know, you know, sometimes us pro modelers can come into challenges like this. But remember, everything is a challenge. It's not really a mistake. And don't look at it negatively. Just think of it as a challenge. You know, if I really wanted to, I could just use that green uh, filler and completely skim this thing. Or I could actually decide to get rid of the grid lines and just sand them right off. And then it would bring the grid lines down into that etched spots on the plastic. And then, um, then I could, you know, smooth the, the whole thing out as one piece. But I'm actually really wanted to leave the grid lines on for the deckling. So that's what I've decided to do. And unfortunately, my primer also filled in these little windows up here on the B, B and C deck. And when I sanded them, I pretty much sanded that smooth off. So, yeah, there's another challenge painting on those windows. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to wash all the dust off this. There was only one spot on the saucer that I found that I needed to putty and that's this little hole in the seam right there. I don't know where that came from. It's the only one I got. So I'm going to just skim a little of the green putty in there and then we will paint it. But before we go I need to make uh, mention of a few things with the paint. First off, you don't want to ever paint on a day that is really, really hot because your paint can come out of the spray can, land on the model, and almost dry instantaneously so that it leaves a really pebbly orange peel type of effect instead of something nice and glassy smooth. You also don't really want to paint on a very cold day, and unfortunately in this video I had to do that. The weather was about zero minus two plus two Celsius and um, that really is tricky to deal with because your paint wants to come out and still be runny it's not really setting so the more you paint the more runny and drippy it gets and it's really not ideal I find out here in Alberta the best conditions are between plus 15 plus 22 somewhere in that ballpark because then your paint is still somewhat controllable. It's, you know, hitting the plastic and it's starting to set slightly instead of just being slick and coming off. And uh, yeah, that's basically when I find it the best. Um, there's other problems you that can happen if it's too cold. You can actually have paint go frosty. Sometimes it, the humidity can affect you, like in British Columbia, all the paint came out foggy no matter what kind of day it was because the, the precipitation in the air and the humidity caused it to go that way. Uh, it all depends on where you live. I find that Alberta is really a good place to paint in in the summer because everything that I've painted with trim clad or anything comes out glass smooth and <laughs> really reflective. It, the paint seems to do what it's supposed to do out here. And here we are outside again in the nice weather. There's a little bit of snow falling, very slight. Um, you don't really want to be painting if there's snow falling, but I think it's kind of falling straight down. So I got a little bit of um, leeway, because if it was coming in, and you got any of that little water spots on here, when you paint over it, they will melt and they'll leave little holes in your paint job. I've had that happen before, actually. It's not good, especially when you're trying to do a pro job. So. I'm just going to do a little different technique here than the last video where I used a tack rag. Although you could still use a tack rag if you want. But I got this paintbrush. I'm just going to blow on the, the plastic carefully and dust this and blow all the dust off if there's any. Because you can blow the dust, or blow on the model, and the dust sometimes will stick if there's any static or anything. So hopefully this will brush it off as you're blowing on it and not 
cause it to charge up. Okay, I think this warp engine is ready for the gloss coat. Now if you've watched my primer paint video before this one, the technique of spraying is the exact same. You're gonna go start off here and then go across and end here somewhere and then come back, this sort of thing. You don't wanna, you know, arc your hand because remember it goes like thin, thin, thick, 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 thin, 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 right? You want it to go a nice even coat. So you're gonna swivel right with your wrist and don't forget to give a little spray on something neutral so that you can test to see how the flow is coming out of the nozzle in case you have to take the nozzle off or you know clean the hole or whatever you can use a little drill for that always remember to shake the can the little ball is smashing the paint and automatizing it so it will come out the spray nozzle and now one last blow for good luck it looks good and here we go now the the gloss coat is usually a bit thinner than the primer so you want to spray with more distance And be very careful when and watch for drips. Drips and sags. And get the top. And you want to spray so you don't see the primer coming through. Ooh, I'm seeing little specks. I hope it's not that snow coming at me. Yeah, that would be bad. Okay. And there's our engine. Maybe. I'm noticing a bit of a drip starting to come through on the bottom there. So one way to kind of make sure it doesn't pool is to keep this kind of in motion for a bit until it starts to set up and then you should be okay. Remember to turn your can upside down and give that puff out the bottom so that the, it'll clear the nozzle for next time. And then I'm just gonna paint a few more parts and we'll have a look at them on the bench. There is our finished model. Our painting day is over. And as you can see on the secondary hull, it is a very nicely laid out paint job. This is the best trim flag can get. And we have our secondary hull. And then our two warp engines there. And then coming across we have our intercoolers. Now, these ones are blue. <laughs> which is really unique to AMT's paint scheme. Same with the yellow sensor array. And there we have our black end caps. Now we're just going to look at our paint colors again. On the callout sheet you can see that our deflector dish is yellow. And then we have black going in there, which will be next time when we do our detail painting. Steel blue on the back of the shuttle bay doors. So they're going to look again like that, which is very unique. Crimson on the end of our warp engine caps. And steel blue, steel blue on the outside with white in there. And then we've got black there and steel blue. That's that intercooler again. But it doesn't really show you what colors the grills are, like inside your 
in there, those grills, or the grills that are in on the inside of the warp engines. So I am kind of caught between black or steel blue, but at any rate, that is our painting for this session. Well, I hope you enjoyed that painting edition of Monster Hobby's Let's Build It, where we got to actually put the gray paint onto our model of the Enterprise kit and get a really nice, clean, finished result. And I really hope that your paint job will come out as good as that one. All right, next week we're actually going to do something different. We're going to move away from building a little bit and get into a bit of research. Um, what we would be doing is putting on the final painting, painting the details, I'm trying to say. But uh, I'm going to let the paint dry a little longer so that we get a better result with our paint. So we're going to step away from that and we're going to look at starship history and trying to figure out which starship you actually want to build. Because remember, there's, according to the old box in the Franz Joseph Technical Manual, there's 14 of these ships in the fleet. So we want to figure out which one seems the most appealing with its history and everything to us personally which mine will be different from yours. So until then, please, if you've missed any of our videos from the past, please check them out here, here, and here. And don't forget to subscribe to us here so I can continue this series and make better and better videos. And the more people we can get to subscribe, the better it is. So until then, live long and prosper.